a social entrepreneur. Really, it's just ordinary people that have seen a problem that isn't being fixed. I always felt from the start that there were people way better than me that could do this job. And then somebody told me, there probably is somebody better than you to do it, but they're not doing it. You are. It really is just taking action to actually make it a reality. You get one project across the line and people say, wow, he's not a lunatic. <laughs> it does actually work. All across this little country, there are people with big ideas that are changing Ireland. From housing, to health, to mental health, they invent a solution and put in the hard yards to see it through. In this series, we see how their big ideas and sheer determination are changing countless people's lives. It's orientation week in DCU, and over 100 clubs and societies have set out their stall including Europe's first neurodivergent society with founding member Cathy at the helm. OK. Ready? <laughs> cool. Hello. So, do you know what neurodivergent means? Spraxia. Ah! Nice. Gotcha! Welcome! Cool. Yeah. <laughs> as well as having learning differences, such as like dyspraxia, dyscalculia, yeah. dyscumia. We also, neurodivergent can also mean mental health illnesses, so, you know, depression, anxiety, or there are a slew of other differences which don't fit under either of those categories, like autism or uh, epilepsy. Yeah. So we're really a society for neurodivergent people by neurodivergent people. I'm Cathy Brennan. I am a student here at DCU. I study biomedical engineering. I am the founding chairperson of DCU's Neurodivergent Society, the first of its kind in Europe, so that's very exciting. Um, I love chocolate, baking and stationery. Today we were recruiting new members. There's a culture shift in all of Ireland, but it is amplified here just because of the resources that are going into it. So I wasn't surprised that DCU became the first autism-friendly university because that's very typical of DCU. I love DCU. The way that they have really embraced autistic people is very inspiring to all neurodivergent people. With help from autism charity As I Am, DCU is aiming to become the world's first autism-friendly university. Today, society members meet DCU president Brian McCra to discuss how the college can support neurodivergent students. To create the first neurodivergent society in Europe and a university, I think is incredible. So well done. I have to say I'm really pleased to hear that. In any way I can help, just let me know. So what are your plans? What's next? Um, would you like a copy yeah. of our activities plan? Oh. Cultural events, active events. I hope you're going to invite me to some of the weekly afternoon teas, Actually, by the way. You're always welcome. Am I always? Many times. <laughs> How are you finding the campus itself? Because we're, we're learning all the time about things we can improve. I don't know, have you ever used the pods in the libraries? I have. Yes. What do you think? Pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I'm in my second year of enterprise computing and, and I myself am on the autistic spectrum. Basically, this pod that I go to, it's located down there in the O'Reilly Library. Then once you get in, it's really nice little comfy area for you to just relax and, and just be away from all the nonsense and just do your own thing, whether it's, whether it's getting assignments done or studying, it's a really good place. I think it's so important because I think here at DCU we're, we're setting a brilliant example, one I hope which many universities follow not just Trinity or UCD or Maynooth or Galway or Limerick, but every other university in, in Europe and in the whole world. This is history in the making. And I can't wait to see what the future has to offer. Fiona was saying to me about the notion of a campus app for navigation. Is that something, something you'd be interested in us doing? 
Oh, yes. definitely, yeah. I, I know myself, <clears throat> if I don't know where I'm going, I won't go. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. I need to know. That's why I tend to always do a dry run of something. Okay. But if I had an app, absolutely, it'd be great. Yeah. Just to be able to know where you're going. And to highlight quiet spaces, yeah. busy time. Yeah. But if you start specifying what the navigation Could app do, might yeah. do, what you that, would like that would be really good. Yeah. Well, listen, I'm going to have to leave you. Um, I want to keep hearing your ideas in terms of how we can provide a better and better environment. So even this, this evening, I've heard a whole lot of ideas and make sure you invite me to some of your amazing <laughs> events. <laughs> uh, I think what you've done is already put in place a really impressive program. All right, thanks a million. Take care. Bye-bye. We have a lot more awareness now about particularly mental health issues, but I think there's still this um, dissonance between where we think we are, where we need to be, and how we get there. If there are steps somewhere and you're in a wheelchair and there's no ramp, there's a very obvious and clear solution. There should be ramps where there are steps or lifts. But when your um, difficulties are not visible, like say you find lights very distressing, but the same light wouldn't distress the majority of people, it's hard to convince the person to change the light. Meanwhile in Ballymun, Hugh Brennan from O'Coolon Housing is trying to get some design details past the buyers of his affordable homes. We hold reasonably regular members meetings that keep people informed about what's going on. The architect here and the architect has included some little discrete splashes of colour across the elevations. Some people have you know, said that maybe they don't want any particular colour on the house and others are, are quite open to it. So Joe is going to explain the thinking behind it and then hopefully we will get broad agreement at, at the end of the meeting. We don't often get a chance to explain why we do things to the people who end up using and living in the buildings that we design. So we're very grateful to have this opportunity. Here instead of using colour on the front door, we're doing it slightly differently. We're putting little, on some houses, one window might have a little colour trim and nothing else, or one house might have a colour panel beside the door. And we've got a range or a palette of colours that we're keen to use. A little graphic here just to show what we mean. Now this isn't a photorealistic. We've got four windows that have colour on them. And we've got three houses that have a colour panel beside the door. And I believe it'll actually work very well, but I do believe that colour shouldn't be imposed on people. So sometimes we stick our neck out, we don't always get it right. But in this case, a huge amount of thought and consideration has gone into it. So, as I said, I'm happy to listen. I'm glad you listened to me. And I will listen carefully to what you have to say. Can we not just plant flowers in the garden? It's very tacky, house? I think. It is quite tacky looking. Like it's just, no, I don't build this gorgeous neo-modern house. I just feel like it's very primary schoolish. I wouldn't disagree with you. I mean, the colours are used, especially in primary schools. <clears throat> but in primary schools, we use huge slabs of colour. You know, th th this is quite subtle, and, and the colours we've picked are quite subtle. I just don't feel that paying all that money to have to stick a colour, whether it be white, black, or whatever, you know, when I don't want it. What I'd like you to do is, is to consider the positive effect this is going to have, and then to take your personal choices. And, and as I said, we're happy to spend a couple of days rejigging all the colours so that everybody that nobody feels they've got something imposed on them. If, if, you want, if you want a colour door instead of having a colour panel, that's fine. She's going to kill me. Yeah, but now that we have made a commitment to do it, we can do it. So what I'm going to suggest to you is that Joe has prepared a palette of colours here, OK? For those of you who do not want it, you either just go for white or light grey. We'll write that on as well. Is that OK? We have general agreement on that. We do. Great. OK. In Glengariff, the Walsh family are revisiting the site of the accident which saw their teenage son Jack lifted by ICRR's air ambulance to Cork University Hospital. Jack suffered a concussion after falling on the rocks in a remote area. I hit my head first time. I wasn't really knocked out the whole way. And then when I hit the second one, I was gone. And from there, I don't remember anything till I landed in the CUH. I thought he'd broke his back, like, back in, because his legs couldn't end up over his head. Struggling with mobile phone coverage, Jack's parents eventually got through to a 999 operator. He told us what to do. He explained that there was an ambulance dispatched from Castletown Bear, which was probably 45 minutes 
behind us. There was a car dispatched, an emergency car dispatched from Dunmanway, which would be 45 minutes or a half an hour the other way. So effectively, I was in between the two of them, and the ambulance people had explained then as well, there's no trauma, care, etc., in Bantry Hospital. Then it came through that the helicopter was going to arrive at the hospital. I had been expecting the big, large Coast Guard helicopter, but I didn't recognise this helicopter. The shocking thing for me was that it's a charity. That's the thing that kind of brought us home to us. They need funds raised to keep it running, to keep it facilitated. You can see the importance of it to a rural area. Thanks to the rapid response of the air ambulance, Jack is improving. Every day I started progressing better. Like I started being able to move a little quicker or maybe lift. I was able to lift a cup of tea on the first day. So I was able to lift a cup of tea by the third day. And at the moment, I'm walking perfect. I'm able to move a lot quicker. I'm not able to run because I get headaches. Karen started fundraising or organising fundraising that day and visited all the businesses in Bantry and in Glengariff. Everybody every, was every amazing. They were. There was no problem. What do you want? Do you want a voucher? Do you anything? They're all like just so behind it. Tonight, the community is rowing in behind Karen's fundraising table quiz for the air ambulance. Don't be shy to put money in the bucket, I suppose, because we never know who's going to need the service, you know. Jack's grandfather is very grateful for the help Jack received from the air ambulance. We got this terrible phone call that Jack had had an accident and there was an airlift involved. Needless to mention, we were stuck to the floor. It's a service you don't hear of and you think you never need it. But eventually, when it comes to your door, do you thank God? The tables, there's 40 tables sold here tonight. People that have the notion of doing a quiz or coming here have just paid over their 40 euro for the table. People power. And at the end of the day, people power by is a mighty tool to have behind you. Absolutely very happy with it. It was like short notice. Um, it was just word of mouth and real community effort that got behind to spread the word. And oh, it's great to be able to do it. You know, we were so delighted at the care that Jack got. So this is a little thing that we can do to, you know, say thanks to the charity. It's brilliant. Irish Community Rapid Response are hugely reliant on fundraising to keep the air ambulance flying. Founder John Kearney has come along to meet the family and to thank the community for their support. So this is John Kearney and he just has a few words to say. Thank you. I make it very few because in fairness, they take a lot of concentration for these, these tough questions. Um, look, I'm, first of all, look, I want to thank Stephen Kearney for tonight and organising this event for us, which is really important. It was yesterday, 30 days since the helicopter went live. Last year, the Air Corps done 360 missions. We anticipated we'd do a bit more, of about 500 in a year. Yesterday, I got f faxed that we did 56 missions in the last 30 days. That's 56 patients, 56 families, and 56 communities. And that's one month. Hello, Charlie. Jack, good to meet you. No, Karen Burnyman. I didn't even know I was in a helicopter until I went home. It's just, just, it's just really encouraging from our side because we have a big undertaking to go out to communities and um, get communities supported. So if, even if we get half the people coming forward that was assisted by this um, in this short period of time doing, doing events for us, you know, it, life will be easier by Christmas because we have a lot of money to raise before Christmas to keep this service in the air. What's really incredible is Jack himself um, is here tonight. He's the same age as my daughter and he's good, he's in the spirits, he's recovering, he's back at school and that's what matters. In Athen Rye, Prepare Me founder Katrina is beginning another busy day. Time to prepare dinner, yeah, so normally Maybe it's crazy, but I do this in the morning. It's just too busy here in the afternoon to try and get it done. What brought me to the idea for Prepare Me was in the disability sector, we present as much information as possible visually because that's what meets the needs of the people that use the service best. I've always worked on the front line and a big part of my daily job would be to support somebody or prepare somebody for whatever their day was going to hold for them. And that could be anything. You know, today it might be that somebody did have to have a blood test taken. Tomorrow it could be that somebody needed to have 
a haircut or go to the cinema for the first time or whatever it might be. So I would have spent a lot of time at work taking pictures. I was always ringing like bowling alleys and saying, you know, is it okay if I pop in to take a picture of your bowling alley and whoever's working behind the counter and your toilets? Because I knew maybe whoever I was supporting, they would really like a heads up on what those bathrooms look like. You just don't always have the time or you don't have the resources or you don't have the access to images that you might need. I kept saying at work all the time, oh my God, why is this so hard to do? Why hasn't somebody solved this problem? Why isn't there a website that you can go onto and you can just type in bloods or dentists and up will come, you know, ready-made picture stories and a library of visuals that you can use. So in the pack, we have a video model code, which will bring you to like a really short uh, video showing Joshua on his trip to the doctors. First, the doctor takes Joshua's temperature with a thermometer. He places the thermometer next to Joshua's ear. There's an in-ear thermometer, an otoscope for checking eyes and throat and ears. And there's a real stethoscope. And then there's a picture story which brings you through Joshua's visit to the doctors and all of the parts that go with it. And then it goes back through <clears throat> the different pieces of equipment that a doctor usually uses. And then it shows you a visual schedule of all the different steps. So it's just a series of images that breaks down the examination into um, easier to understand steps. And there's a couple of activities showing the equipment again. So you're continuously exposing a child to some of the stuff that they might find very scary. Joshua is a young boy, he's 11, I think. He'll kill me if he's 12. He acted in our resource for going to the doctors. So he's gonna come over to see this, him and his mum. This will be Joshua's first time seeing the Prepare Me resource pack that he features in. You're just right. Look what I have. You ready oh. to see yourself? Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you see what it says on it? Prepare me for going to the... The doctor, yeah. yeah. The two doctors on it. Whose face is going to be inside? <gasps> oh, look. So this is what's going to go out to any boys or girls that are worried or scared about going to the doctor. And the primary care centre down here, the doctor's surgery, every doctor's going to have one of these in their room. Wow. So every boy or girl that goes to the doctor down here in Athenry, who are they going to see when they go in to see the doctor? Yeah, they're going to see you. Unless you actually need it, you can't understand the value, how amazing as a resource it is. With Joshua specifically, um, his stress would manifest itself in extremely tight muscles, um, which affects everything. So for him to be comfortable doing an activity makes a massive, massive difference. Joshua is happy, smiley, aren't you? Joshua loves life, loves football, hurling. He'll tell you, what do you love? Anything with a? A ball. In an ideal world, we wouldn't be having this conversation because this stuff would just be commonplace. People would understand that the stuff that Prepare Me is making is stuff that the typical population has available to them on a daily basis. And we just don't think about it because we have it. In an ideal world, yeah, people would care enough to try and do, you know, the small thing that they could do in their establishment or in their business that could make the world of difference to a little boy or girl or to, you know, an adult that has additional needs. In Waterford, 800 teenage girls are arriving at a special event, the second annual Shona Project Conference. The Shona Project aims to educate and inspire today's teenage girls to become tomorrow's strong and resilient young women. Today is our annual conference, so we've been working for six months to prepare for this. What I've tried to build today is the day that I wish I'd been at when I was 14. The event is held on International Day of the Girl, and the Shona Project ambassadors all have a role to play. It's important because it's International Day of the Girl and I think that a lot of people don't even know that that's a day. There was a time where I needed something like this and I didn't get it. I didn't think that I was enough. And it's so important to tell other girls they need to love themselves and they need to grow and allow themselves to be 
unapologetically themselves. I think it's great to, for girls who are already there to help girls who are not yet there. We wanted to bring the girls of the Southeast together to celebrate all that it means to be a girl. It's an age where you are looking for, you are searching for yourself. There is conflict between their dreams, their ambition, and their attitude as well. Tammy has scheduled a lot of variety on the day between guests, topics, and activities. Hi, girls. We got it, Bill. Strong body. Yes. 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 This wasn't the plan. It wasn't the plan at all. So what am I going to do? Am I going to drop to the ground? Am I going to get bitter and resentful? Am I going to drop out of life? No. In order to deal with such loss, I had to turn into the best version of myself. So I had to grow, I had to develop, I had to do all sorts of things and be the nicest version of me that I could be, the best version of me. I'm not frightened of anything now because I feel like I've faced the worst and I've survived it. I want you to hold the hand of the person next to you. I am enough. I am unstoppable. And today I will shine. Let's make some noise for International Day of the Girls. Keep it moving. Oh, I had goosebumps. Like I properly had goosebumps because I just it was, it was messages that I needed to hear. It was an experience that I will always remember, but, but seeing the choir come in. Waterford's Mount Sion Choir, clearly popular, made an unannounced appearance. That seemed to go well. What did the girls think? The energy, yeah. fabulous, no, absolutely brilliant. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was so inspirational, and I know now I'm a empowered woman. There was a great atmosphere. Like it didn't feel like anyone was like judging you or anything. Like it just felt like we were all like in the same. We we're all in the same boat. I just feel like girls always like compete against each other, and like yeah. we should just support each other. You just be yourself. Be yourself. Don't mind other people. Love your body. No, to love, love your yourself. body, to love yourself, to yeah. just have confidence because that's all that really matters is your own relationship with yourself. I remember last year. We were doing the massive beatballs. <laughs> we were all just chucking at each other. But when we all go back to the classroom, we were actually talking seriously about it and yeah. what was going on. And I think it's also important, like the teachers were there mm -hmm. and they saw the difference it made for the students. If yeah. they went in, like let's say on Monday morning and said, oh, so like that speaker that came up and talked about grief, like what do you think about that? And then that might start a conversation yeah. in school and stuff. Yeah. I can't wait for 2020. Yeah, yeah. So so good. Good. It's it's so can't wait a big year. I can yeah. just feel yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. We're just done, but I'm like, let's yeah. go again. Yeah, literally. <laughs> Being a social entrepreneur is just an amazing thing because this is my job, this is what I get to do. I'm really, really lucky. You know, I work hard, but I have the best job in the world. I'm going to take the weekend off now and then Monday morning, we're going to sit down and make the plan for whatever's to come next. Next time on Changing Ireland, My Big Idea, we see the impact that these ideas are having as we go inside a brand new Okulon home, visit As I Am's annual conference on autism, and hear about the sacrifices that social entrepreneurs make to realize their big ideas.